Thanks, Martin. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invite. Um, you guys have a phenomenal program. It's really an honor to be here and talk with you. It's, I'm finding it warm in here, maybe because I wore my jacket, so I'm going to just uh, lecture without a jacket if you don't mind. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, about sort of a, a project that's now become a Canadian-wide project looking at uh, metabolism and prostate cancer, and uh, sort of the project or uh, program we've put together to tackle this very interesting question. So what I'm going to do is try and weave the story that uh, suggests that prostate cancer has some very unique properties and this may be exploitable uh, in the context of therapy, uh, perhaps as a novel way to, to tackle the prostate cancer dilemma. So there are some you know, unique metabolic properties of prostate cancer. Some of them are unique in the sense it's the only cancer that does it. Or, and others are unique in that only a few cancers have these unique properties. But the first is, is glucose utilization. Prostate cancer uses glucose in a very unique way. Um, and um, in fact, most cancers exhibit a Warburg effect, but prostate cancer, if anything, has a reduced or a reverse Warburg effect. And it's quite interesting because um, if you look at how glucose is used by prostate cancer, it's not traditional glycolysis. It tends to be more oxidative phosphorylation. And I think the most obvious uh, clinical ramification of this is we don't use FDG PET scanning in prostate cancer. And for years we've known that it's not a glucose avid tumor. Yet we never really, I think, sat down and said, why? Why is this, is this important for us? And is this this an uh, this physiologic observation is something that we could perhaps uh, exploit. So uh, this is a PET scan of a patient of mine. I think I showed this last night, but basically uh, this patient had a little lymph node in the interior of cable space, and you can see on PET scanning uh, it lit up. This is a patient who had a radical prostatectomy about 10 years earlier. So this is, I think, an example of <clears throat> the fact that choline here is a fuel for prostate cancer as a source of carbon, yet traditionally glucose is not. So that's a hint already that somehow metabolically prostate is different than other cancers. In very far advanced disease, some, some prostate cancers are FDG avid, but certainly not in early disease where you have to use alternate fuels to image it. Uh, choline, uh, acetate has been used, um, but uh, traditional FDG glucose just doesn't work. And that leads us to this whole concept of the Krebs cycle, and I'm sure all the residents in the room remember the Krebs cycle from biochemistry. Uh, here it is. You can see it here. Uh, but basically, this is a cycle or system by which um, basically fuel and other metabolites are uh, created. And uh, this, this cycle is a very important uh, interest in terms of how a carbon is um, sort of created and also how a variety of other metabolites are created. And this cycle is still relatively unknown in the context of prostate cancer. We don't know exactly the direction of the cycle, and it is a cycle. It could be bidirectional uh, in some areas, and it's unclear how this cycle works in, in the context of prostate cancer. It's known in some cell lines, and it's known in some animal models, but nobody knows to date exactly how the Krebs cycle is functioning in situ in human prostate cancer. Um, so this uh, Krebs cycle, as you can see, is a series of chemical reactions. It generates carbon dioxide and it provides ATP as well as uh, precursors of amino acids. And uh, this is also obviously critical in cellular respiration because it provides the NADH. What other interesting <laughs> metabolic properties does uh, prostate cancer have? The other is the mitochondria. The mitochondria seems to be a bit messed up in prostate cancer. And this is not totally unique. Some breast cancers um, exhibit this. But uh, the, it's been shown that the mitochondrial genome seems to play a role in prostate cancer progression. And there's evidence uh, in, some, uh, in the experimental systems where if you actually transplant native mitochondria into castration-resistant prostate cancer cells, you can restore a castration-sensitive phenotype. So there is some very interesting interplay between what's going on in the mitochondria and the rest of the, the cell in the context of prostate cancer. Some other interesting uh, observations is citrate. Uh, citrate is uh, secreted by the prostate. Ostensibly, that relates to semen um, 
you know, it's one of its functions of the prostate is to make citrate for, for seminal um, properties to enable uh, uh, sperm to be more motile. But it's interesting um, that when that switch from benign to cancer occurs in the prostate, citrate export in those cells tends to cease. Um, and you get more oxidative phosphorylation, which is the other way glucose can be used in the cell. Um, and um, so this is some of the interesting, you know, another interesting metabolic feature of uh, prostate cancer. And I'll explain this a little bit more, but, uh, you know, right now we've been talking mostly about um, fuel energy metabolism, but if you go to the lipid side of things, the mevalonate pathway is also upregulated in prostate cancer, and a, uh, it's a, a pathway that prostate cancer is somewhat addicted to, as one would expect, given that it's also the precursor of androgens. Uh, but you have an elevated expression of mevalonate pathway genes, and we'll see, I'll show you how this all comes together. Um, just before that, a couple of interesting other clinical aspects. Prostate cancer is a very long natural history, especially early disease. So in my view, certainly if we could harness or manipulate metabolism of prostate cancer, um, even a little bit, that could have a significant impact on disease progression. If you have a disease that progresses over 10 years and you can slow it down by 20%, well, then that's 12 years. Um, and then there's a lot of epidemiologic uh, evidence that links prostate cancer and, and metabolism, and we'll talk about that. Just back to the mevalonate pathway for a second. It's the process by which um, basically uh, uh, acetyl-CoA comes through down to um, uh, mevalonate, and this is inhibited by the statins, and in particularly the Shreb uh, B2. The uh, Shreb BP2 is a transcription factor as part of the feedback loop when you inhibit this pathway. I'll show it here, um, has uh, many uh, effects that seem to um, be very important in uh, prostate cancer uh, modulation. What about the epidemiology? I'm actually, as uh, Dr. Gleef told you, I'm an epidemiologist by, by training, and there's a significant amount of evidence between a link of prostate cancer and metabolic syndrome. I think this is another way to tie this together. So. This is a paper we published some many years ago, um, 2007, and at the time we were very interested in, in diet and prostate cancer. And most of us were, were focused on high fat diet because we all thought that high fat diets was driving <coughs> prostate cancer. <clears throat> and at the time, I was intrigued at the time by the Atkins phenomena where, where you'd have this low carb, high fat uh, thing. So I we talked to our people in the lab and we said, uh, why don't we look and see what the impact of a low-carb, high-fat diet is and compare it to a high-carb, high-fat diet in this our uh, LINCAP xenographs. And you can see here, uh, what we, we, can sh we showed here is that the tumors, or uh, the mice that ate the high-carb, high-fat diet, their uh, tumors grew faster than those on the low-carb, high-fat diet. And uh, we showed that this was associated with hyperinsulinemia and uh, this was uh, uh, an interesting observation because for many years we thought that it was the fat driving it and not necessarily, for, for lack of a better term, the carbohydrate. So that leads to this concept of metabolic syndrome. So for those of you who are just out of med school, you know what metabolic syndrome is. For those of you who are not, you might not. But basically, uh, I call this uh, male aging, but it also does happen to women, right? There are five criteria for metabolic syndrome clinically. Obesity, elevated triglycerides, elevated cholesterol, hypertension, or glucose tolerance impairment. Those are the five criteria. And it's been shown that if you possess three of these criteria, you have metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome is an interesting condition because it's sort of a disease, of the, it's almost a new disease. It never would have existed prior to the last, you know, 100 years where we sort of mastered nature and now uh, have three square plus meals a day. Um, with a couple of bourbons after uh, to, to, to top it off. So um, why is metabolic syndrome important? Um, it's important because it increases your risk of prostate cancer. It also increases the aggressivity of prostate cancer. And ironically, when we treat men with hormone therapy for advanced prostate cancer, we also induce a, a, a metabolic syndrome. So in part, our um, attempt to control the cancer, we're actually... 
also inducing uh, a state that may make it ironically worse. Um, <clears throat> and of course, it increases the risk of, of death uh, for your prostate cancer patients, not only for prostate cancer, but from non-prostate cancer causes. So it's been shown if you have metabolic syndrome, your risk of stroke, heart attack, all-cause mortality is brought forward quite significantly. And I think from my point of view as, as an investigator, I think the question is, is this a target that we can now manipulate to improve outcomes even in the context of prostate cancer? So this is a paper we published a couple of years ago, um, some work done by one of my master's students, Bimon Bindi. And what we did here is we asked a very simple question. For years, when men would come in for a prostate biopsy, we've been asking them about metabolic syndrome because we've had this in, uh, interest. We've been asking them about their weight and their height, and we've been asking them about their cholesterol and their medications and their blood pressure, and we measure their body surface area when they come in. And this was a, a cohort that we assembled. Um, <clears throat> and what we basically did here, large cohort, um, and what we did here is we asked a very simple question. If a patient had metabolic syndrome, was his risk of cancer higher at biopsy than those who didn't have it? And the answer was yes. We also asked, is your risk of high-grade disease higher if you have metabolic syndrome? The answer was yes. And then we also asked, I think this was quite unique of it, what if you only have one or two components of the metabolic syndrome? Just hypertension, just obesity. And the answer seemed to be there was sort of this dose-response observation. So if you had one component of the metabolic syndrome, your risk was better than if you had none of them, was worse. And if you had two, it was even higher. And of course, you had three, which was frank metabolic syndrome. Uh, it went up. So even possessing some of the components of the metabolic syndrome was important. Now, it had previously been recognized that there was an obesity and prostate cancer association. And even when we controlled for that, the, there was still... An association. So this is not just another way of looking at the question of obesity. Because even patients without obesity, but had hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, for example, and type 2 diabetes would have had a higher, a higher risk. So um, this paper, I think, was, was very illuminating uh, for us because it was the first time that this was, I think, uh, shown in a, in a very calculated way. Around the same time, we also published... Um, our experience in our active surveillance population. We have a, a cohort at, at uh, Princess Margaret of about 900 patients on active surveillance. And we also showed that um, at the time, we had a 585 men, that the risk of progression after the confirmatory biopsy, so you have to be very careful here. A man comes in, diagnosed with uh, low-risk prostate cancer, placed on surveillance. They should all have a biopsy about a year or so later and those, presumably those first two biopsies, uh, progression at that second biopsy or what we call a confirmatory biopsy is probably not really progression, but an undersampling of what was there that you missed the first time. But if we looked at progression downstream from the second biopsy, um, that uh, certainly obesity, we didn't have the power to look at all the metabolic syndrome components, but certainly obesity was associated uh, with this by, by each five, as you can see here, each five units of BMI increase the risk of progression by 50%. So there seems to be evidence that if you possess a tumor and you have an unfavorable metabolic state, uh, then the chance that your tumor gets uh, worse is uh, increased. And a lot of people say to me, uh, well, I can't grow that fast. How could prostate cancers grow that fast even in a three and five year interval? It's quite interesting. I think we're learning a lot from serial MRI now. Like we have some patients with serial MRIs where we actually get lesions going from 3 to 12 millimeters in 3, 4, 5 years. You never would have thought that went that quickly. But in fact, I think we're learning that some of them actually do. And even, you know, traditionally low grades, Gleason 6 and 3 plus 4 type tumors, some of them actually grow fast, at least based on imaging that we couldn't uh, do before. And with all this MRI, uh, we're starting to find it. So that's an interesting observation. The, the question then becomes, uh, what about diabetes? You would think... If um, patients with um, metabolic syndrome are at worse um, sort of uh, metabolic state than those, and you think the diabetic, the type 2 diabetics are the worst. And they sort of are, but they're not. We maybe can discuss that in the question and answer. But at least in this particular um, uh, paper, what they looked at is 
diabetes and, and diabetics and non-diabetics, and it turned out basically that the, the diabetics tend to have less failure after radical prostatectomy than non-diabetics because they were on metformin. So that's a little bit of a clue because metformin modulates the hyperinsulinemia that one gets with this state. So that, what about metformin? So we have a big interest in this particular compound. Uh, this is a biguanide. Um, it's not the only one. Uh, fenformin is another biguanide, but it's now off the market. And basically what these drugs are are electron transport chain inhibitors. They in induce energetic stress in the cell. And this is a, a primary treatment for type 2 diabetes. Um, and there's been some, it's a generic drug, 13 cents a day. There's not no longer patented. And there's a great interest now in the scientific community in using this agent perhaps as an adjunct or as an anti-cancer agent by modulating the metabolic syndrome or the metabolic state. <clears throat> um, it's unclear how this drug works, but let me run, run to it. You swallow it as an oral tablet. <coughs> it's absorbed in the uh, enterohepatic circulation. In the liver, it uh, induces energetic stress, uh, uh, basically by um, AMPK modulation. And what happens is the liver says, I, I'm undergoing energetic stress. I am no longer going to perform gluconeogenesis, right? And by doing that, it lowers um, insulin levels because glucose levels go down. And then that, there is a, an endocrine effect that then gets transported throughout the regular circulation. There's some debate, <clears throat> I think, although I think it's now been solved in the last year or two, about, how, about whether enough metformin passes through the liver and circulate systemically to have effects. So there's this debate between direct effects and indirect effects of the drug. But certainly at the cellular level, uh, by modulating AMPK, uh, it modulates the mTOR pathway. That's, but I would say now every um, sort of two weeks or every month, there's some paper telling us a new mechanism by which metformin may influence carcinogenesis or progression of cancer. Um, Again, very basic stuff here. This is just some um, evidence uh, in vitro of metformin decreasing prostate cancer cell growth. Uh, but again, w uh, whether this actually happens in the body is debatable, given what we were just talking about, about concentrations in the systemic circulation. Um, uh, metformin also uh, influences uh, cell, cell cycle genes and um, also... Um, has uh, an apoptotic effect, and I'll show that in a sec. So we got interested in metformin um, about uh, about seven or eight years ago. We looked at it in the lab as, after that uh, study, looking at the Atkins diets in, in the experimental uh, system in mice. And then we decided that it's one of the great things being a surgeon and into prevention, and great is that you can use your patients as a living laboratory. Right? And that's what, one of the great things about what we do. And what we conducted here was we took patients who had radical pro who were going for radical prostatectomy, took advantage of the Canadian wait, wait lists, and we asked patients to take metformin. Now, to our knowledge, this was the first time ever that men who were not diabetic were treated with metformin. So we took um, uh, patients and we uh, gave them um, metformin and then interrogated the tissue once it was removed at the time of surgery. And what we showed is that the KI67 um, index was significantly lowered. Um, and we also showed that there was less 4-EBP1 immunostaining. Why that's important is that's along the mTOR pathway. So at least suggested, perhaps, that there was maybe a direct effect on the prostate cancer cell itself. And we also measured um, tissue levels in the prostate, and they certainly were um, consistent with, with, with levels that exerted a therapeutic effect. So again, this was sort of building up data um, to sort of um, make a case that maybe this could be an anti-prostate cancer agent. And around the same time, one of my PhD students, David Margell, uh, we decided to interrogate some of Ontario's large databases. So what we did here <coughs> is we um, assembled a cohort of men, and what we did is we asked a very simple question. If you were a diabetic man in Ontario, and by happenstance, your doctor gave you metformin, what would your be your prostate cancer outcome? 
compared to if you got a different agent for type 2 diabetes. Okay, so we assembled here a cohort of, this is 25,000 men, and what we did is we looked at uh, metformin use, and sure enough, it turns out that if you um, were um, exposed to metformin, your chance of um, dying of prostate cancer was 24% lower than if you got, didn't get metformin. And as we expected, the other agents, like the, gl the glitazones or sulfonylureas, did not confer a protective effect. Um, the other interesting observation, which I'll get to later, is the fact that overall mortality was lowered in uh, metformin patients, where it wasn't in uh, all the other drugs, which, which is kind of an interesting uh, observation. And I'll get back to that in a sec. But this was a particularly powerful study. Uh, uh, as best you, you know, obviously you can't do randomized trials, these are all diabetic uh, patients, uh, but it was a very interesting um, observation. Getting back to the, the mortality piece, it's interesting because metformin was the drug to give in the 60s and 70s for diabetes, and it fell off once it went generic because the pharma companies were pushing the newer agents. Um, and it only came back when people started to look at mortality, and in fact it's interesting, all the diabetic agents in type 2 diabetes lower the glucose levels equivalently, but only metformin is the only agent that's been shown to improve overall mortality. And that's why it's sort of made a comeback in the context of diabetes. And again, we showed it again in this particular uh, data set, which for us was, was interesting to see. And people have even questioned whether this has anything to do with diabetes. And that's why there's actually an interest in using perhaps metformin as a, a general anti-aging tonic or a tablet because it may have nothing to do with the diabetes at all. That maybe it just, uh, because of its overall effects, maybe uh, there are all, also evidence in things like cardiovascular disease, uh, dementia, a variety of other conditions that metformin may be protective. So it may be a generalizable, it, it may have other benefits as well. A couple of other things. Um, just for one second, I, I was mentioning earlier just a little sort of sidebar that metformin um, may be an agent for, for early prostate cancer. It may also be an agent to augment advanced prostate cancer. And the reason for that is, I was telling you earlier that when we put men on hormone therapy for advanced disease, we induce a metabolic syndrome. This was just a, a paper by uh, Marate a couple of years ago where he looked at uh, the risk of uh, developing um, <coughs> A metabolic syndrome on hormone therapy. And basically what, what it shows is that even at about a year, uh, at baseline about 10 to 20 percent of men have metabolic syndrome at baseline, but by the end of the year about another 10 to 15 percent develop it as a result of uh, low T levels. Um, now one little study was done uh, by a group in England, uh, Nodes and colleagues, where they actually looked in a randomized uh, fashion at metformin and lifestyle in combination uh, to see if it would help ADT associated side effects. And it's quite easy. It's tiny little trials, 40 patients. And even, and despite that, with 40 patients, you can see there was a benefit noted in terms of weight, in terms of BMI, in terms of cholesterol levels, and in terms of hemoglobin A1C, not, not surprisingly, and a variety of other measures. And, and even in looking at the pre post as opposed to the Post post, because obviously you could look at intergroup and within group, uh, patients on metformin also even had a benefit in terms of hypertension. So, in, in this very small pilot study, there's some evidence that using metformin may, may even counterbalance some of the metabolic effects of uh, hormone therapy. <coughs> Let's move on to the statin drugs. Um, <clears throat> the statin drugs, as I mentioned, uh, inhibit uh, the mevalonate pathway, and um, <clears throat> it's uh, in particularly these mevalonate end products. I work with a woman called Linda Penn on a lot of this stuff, but it's, it's these um, SREBP2 uh, um, end products that, that get activated that seem to have an important impact, and then that statins may in particular also benefit the prostate cancer um, story. And this is just some evidence. Rob Hamilton, one of our junior faculty, uh, published in JNCI some years ago that uh, statin medications lowered PSA levels, maybe because it just lowers uh, T. But there's some evidence <coughs> to the right you can see 
that the risk of failing after radical prostatectomy is lower among statin users, and uh, there was a dose response. <coughs> so when we started to try and tackle this problem, we started, uh, we started dealing with a very simple and maybe non-scientific observation, which is that most people on metformin are also on statins, right? Because most diabetics are also in such high risk for heart disease that their doctors put them on statins. <coughs> Um, so, disentangling what's the effect of one versus the other from, uh, from data sets becomes extremely prohibitive. And secondly, they're both cheap and widely available, so why not just throw them together and see if, we, if perhaps both of them uh, make sense as an anti-cancer strategy. So, so, we started to map this out, but basically uh, we started to look um, from a signaling point of view, where, where can statins and metformin both sort of display um, uh, evidence of additive or synergistic as aspects? And it turns out, if you look here in the electron transport chain, there's evidence that statins inhibit that along with biguanides, and also Shreb BP2 um, with the sterile feedback loop. There's also evidence that AMPK uh, inhibits it. So there was yet another area where these would sort of come together um, for possible additive effects by using both in combination. Now it's interesting, although we didn't publish this in our paper because our reviewers couldn't understand it, but if you looked at the same paper that looked at metformin and prostate cancer in our large cohort, if you looked at statin users, there was also a significant protective effect in terms of um, um, uh, uh, using statins Oops. And the other thing that was interesting is there was an interactive term, okay? So what's an interactive term in epidemiology? It means it's a test for synergy. So if you looked at patients technically who used both statins and metformin, there was additional pr protective benefit. And uh, we didn't put that in the paper because the reviewers asked us to take it out because it was very black boxy because the way these studies are done are extremely complex. Um, I'll give you an example. We did something called a cumulative use exposure um, analysis. And just to give you an idea, there's, there's about 4,000 columns for every patient in the data sets for these, these studies. And supercomputers take about a week to spit out the data. And the way this is done is what we learn is a man may get metformin, lose 10 pounds, go off it, and then he'll gain it back and go on it again 18 months later. Like, how do you handle that epidemiologically? Some go on it for two months and they, have no, they don't tolerate it well, and they're off it forever. You don't want to include that as an exposed patient forever. So there's a science around this called cumulative use. But what happens is it's hard to do cumulative use with both drugs uh, based on the modeling. But, and and it, it's very black boxy, and the result that's spit out is, is not intuitive. But nevertheless, when we did do this analysis, there was evidence for cooperation between statins and metformin in terms of reducing prostate cancer, specific mortality. So again, some work in the lab done with uh, some of our people. So this is very sort of basic stuff, looking at combination statin and metformin, uh, looking here on the left in, um, in a cell in vitro model. You can see that basically fluvastatin and metformin uh, do much better than either agent alone. We have evidence of, of apoptotic ac activation. Xenograph models, you can see that fluvastatin and metformin seem to suppress uh, growth uh, better than either agent alone. And, and there was also this interesting paper uh, that came out. This is not from our group, uh, Babcock and colleagues. And what they looked at is in, in the CRPC model, they showed that combination simvastatin and metformin was basically more effective than docetaxel, right? Uh, granted, this is an animal, it's a model system, but nevertheless, that is the standard of care, or, or at least one of the components of standard of care for CRPC. So some interesting observations for this combination. So this led us to put together um, a research um, consortium. Um, and this is uh, funded by a group of uh, philanthropic guys. Um, they actually hold a poker tournament every year. They play Texas Hold'em. <laughs> so it's called Hold'em for Life is the name of their foundation. Um, and these are some of the more actual personal friends of mine who've, who've started this. But uh, they've um, given us $5 million to try and tackle this, this problem. 
And you can see here that um, uh, Martin uh, Gleave, as well as YZ Wang, are important um, uh, players in this, um, in this network. And we brought together some experts uh, from Montreal, the metabolomics uh, core over there, and, and, and some uh, other cross-Canada investigators to try and tackle some of this. So there's some components to this, and one of them is the mass study. So the mass study I'll introduce to you is a, a cross-Canada study. Um, and what we're doing here is, um, um, Dr. Gleave referred to the Redeem study, where we took men with very low risk prostate cancer, randomized them between dutasteride and, and placebo. We're basically doing the same study, but we're using metformin instead of dutasteride. So um, <clears throat> this is a, a multi-center randomized trial currently ongoing and accruing, where we're taking patients with very low risk prostate cancer, and they take two tablets a day, they're placebo or metformin, and we re-biopsy them one and a half and three years later. The ultimate goal, obviously, is to try and determine if patients randomized to uh, metformin have a lower chance of progressing. And um, we're at, uh, aiming for 407 patients. We're at about 250 right now. Um, so we're getting there a bit slower than anticipated, mostly because very low risk prostate cancer is disappearing. People aren't doing biopsies the way they used to. Uh, but we're getting there. Uh, and now we, we have the funding. This is funded through a CCSRI uh, impact grant. We've also developed this protocol called the Ligand study, which stands for Lipitor and Biguanide to Androgen Delay. So it's L-I-G-A-N-D. And basically this is uh, to look at both agents. So what we're taking is patients with biochemical failure. Of course, most of us are uh, introducing hormone therapy when the PSA is about 10. <coughs> so we have a big wide window between you know, failing radiation, PSA rising, and actually instituting hormone therapy. And we decided what a great, again, using our patients as a living laboratory. And we're going to see that, we're going to see if combination by guanide and statin in these patients can delay PSA rise uh, in patients with uh, M0 disease but biochemical failure, hormone sensitive disease. And, um, and this is a phase two randomized trial. Um, and it's 110 patients. So here we're looking for a, a, a PSA signal. Can we delay significantly the time to starting hormone therapy with the idea then being if it's positive, we move to a formal phase three trial. Um, and this uh, trial is imminently open at our center and we're opening about another four or five sites um, also. So the idea here is to look at uh, this, again, use the, the patients in that space. Um, the only other competing trial here, there's the PRIME trial, which is the metformin study, but, um, as well as um, there's the um, <coughs> enzalutamide trial, uh, but you can start them later. <coughs> so they can go from this one to that one. <coughs> Excuse me. A few other things that we're doing. This is one of the things I'm really excited about, taking a lot of my time to get it going, is something called uh, an in vivo tracer analysis. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys have ever heard of CIRMA. What is it? it stands for Stable Isotope Resolved Metabolomic Analysis, CIRMA. And what we're doing in this particular study, and we hope to have our first patient done by April, that's one of our deliverables, is we're actually going to take men going for radical prostatectomy and infuse in them a stable isotope. Um, and and that's our and it's our carbon of choice. We're going to start with glucose, but we're also going to study acetate, glutamine, um, and uh, and possibly lactate. But what we're going to be doing is infuse into patients prior to surgery. It's about a three-hour infusion of heavy labeled glucose, so C13 glucose, which is not radioactive. It's just heavy. And then what we'll do is, we, is the tissue is removed and a metabolomic analysis is done where we can trace the fate of all of those infused carbons in terms of the Krebs cycle. So we look at exactly where the carbon has gone in order to map in, in living humans the actual Krebs cycle and, other, and some of the other um, pathways that feed into it. Um, and... Um, this is done at the metabolomic uh, lab in, in, in McGill. So again, we'll be sending our tissues there. We've already done this and perfected it in prostate biopsies. We've perfected it in uh, animal um, studies, but we've yet to do it um, sort of in a, uh, 
the human who's uh, undergoing surgery. So um, this is um, we're having some issues because it's um, <coughs> the the source of the radioactive not radioactive sorry of the stable isotope um, uh, tracers is um, not pyrogen not guaranteed to be pyrogen free. So we're having some issues around how to how to have pharmacy tested to make sure it's safe to actually infuse. And to give you an idea, it's about like I said, it's about a four hour infusion in the in the hospital, and then we take the patient to the OR. And this has been done in in, uh, in brain cancer. This was a paper published in Nature a few years ago with this uh, chap called Ralph D. Bernardinus, who's sort of the leader in this, and he's working with us on this protocol. And this is uh, something a uh, very similar study they did where they um, they infused um, C13 glucose, and it's eight grams an hour. It's it's a lot of glucose, right? Because you have to get a steady state first. In the, in, the, in the human to then, in, in order to go forward. Um, and then again, and you can see by these analysis how much of the glucose ends up in a variety of different metabolites. Um, and this is, we want to be the first in man to do this uh, in, in, uh, at Toronto, along with our group in, uh, um, at Montreal. And, and again, we've done this now in a few of the uh, xenograph models as well uh, through YZ. So this is kind of interesting stuff. Um, and we're, we're kind of excited to get this done. We're, we just got uh, Health Canada, uh, one little snag with Health Canada around the pyrogens just this week, and hope to do our first patient by March or April. So this is just, just a little flavor. We've got a variety of other studies going with uh, YZ, uh, with Martin, um, Gleave, and uh, also with um, a variety of uh, the groups. We have some preliminary evidence of an, of an acetate flux uh, a variety of other uh, phenomena, but we really, once we get these human um, tissues analyzed, I think this is going to be the true metabolic map of, of human prostate cancer. And then the question is, once we get this organized and established, we could then administer perturbators of metabolism, right? Because if we find that there's a particular, let's say it's uh, glutaminolysis, is, is a vulnerable part pathway in, in prostate cancer, and then we could put glut glut glutamine inhibitors, for example. Or, um, so once we understand the map, we could then um, sort of administer metabolic perturbators and see how it affects. So you can give the patient maybe metformin and repeat the analysis, and then see what happens to the fate of all those carbons. So it's going to be a very interesting sort of living model to understand well in, in humans. So I'm going to wrap up because I, I, I a little maybe time for questions by um, showing you this slide. I mean, I think we all agree hallmarks of cancer continue to evolve, and this is the famous uh, uh, Weinberg um, <coughs> um, hallmarks of cancer um, um, wheel that comes out every so often. If you look at the 2000, uh, compared to the 2011, you can see here that one of the emerging hallmarks that was, uh, was oh, that was shown is deregulation of cellular energetics, right? So, so there is a renewed interest in looking at cellular energetics as a, as a way to tackle uh, the cancer problem. <clears throat> and if you look at uh, the same periodical, you can see here aerobic glycolysis inhibitors were also featured as, as a new um, an interesting uh, area to explore in terms of uh, a, a way to maybe tackle the cancer problem. And I think in particular prostate cancer, given some of the unique aspects uh, that I had uh, shown you earlier. So I think um, I'll just conclude and say that obviously prostate cancer metabolism is, is, is somewhat unique, I think, to other cancers. And I think this is a very interesting area to study. And I think uh, given some of the people we put in place uh, and some of the strategies we put in place, I think we're going to have a lot of knowledge uh, bank banked over the next five years to really understand this this problem. And hopefully, we're going to change standard of care. Wait, because you know we're, we've got some basic science, we have some clinical projects as well, and I, I'm hoping that uh, some of this will really impact on clinical care. So I'd be happy to take any of your uh, questions. Thank you for your time, and Martin, thanks for the invite. <laughs>